Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to This Week in Cloud Native, episode number six. This week, we're going to get a little bit more into API deprecation and removal. We're going to play with, like, uh, you know, kind of work our way through sort of the blog post that talks about it. We're going to um, evaluate some of the tools that are out there for um, for testing that we ha we still have that problem. And we're probably going to build some kind clusters, tear some kind clusters down, that kind of thing. So. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a bunch of fun. If you um, are in the chat, go ahead and say hello, and I can highlight you. Um, and it'd be great to, to know that you're out there. So welcome, welcome to This Week in Cloud Native number six. Let's take a look at the news this week, of which there is quite a lot. All right. So again, if you go uh, here on the left-hand side, hackmd.io at Twicken, if you go here, you're going to find a link to the latest um, notes. And if you have anything you'd like to um, share or link in there, feel free to do so. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Glad you're here. So this week is number six. We always start off these pot. We start. Out, we should be starting off these broadcasts with a real reminder of the COC. So this is a cloud native um, foundation uh, video broadcast, and so uh, with any of those things, it's important to remember the CNCF code of conduct. So please don't throw anything to the chat or questions that might be in a violation of that code. Basically, please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Registration for KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2021 is open for in-person and virtual. So definitely check it out. I'm going to be there, and I hope to see you there. That'll be a lot of fun. Cloud Native TV has a bunch of different shows. This week, so this week some of the shows are coming up. Um, we have Cloud Native Latinx in vivo on Tuesday. We have Cloud Native Live on Wednesday, and we have Fields Tested Capture the Flag in Kubernetes. And I'm actually really curious which one Kazan is going to take on there. Um, I wonder if it's going to be KCTF or if there's some other thing that uh, she'll be playing with on the, uh, that they'll be playing with on that on that episode. It'll be tremendous, I'm sure, though. So definitely check that one out. So there's new content every day of the week. Now the news of the week. Um, I actually was able to attend a um, a, cube, a, um, a meetup of the Atlanta, Georgia, Kubernetes meetup. And it was really great. And I'm actually giving a shout out here to James Searcy, who is a good friend of mine, um, works at T-Mobile. And we worked together for quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> I was really impressed with how Joe put the news together for that. And so I've copied a lot of what he's done there and put them in here and figured I'd cover them here as well. So uh, as you already know, API removals are happening in version 122. Definitely check that out. Hello, and welcome, Buck Joe. And hello to you, guy with a cube. Wait, you have a cube? Like this kind of cube? Or some other kind of cube? I'm really curious. Um, 
So some of the stuff that happened this week or is getting ready to happen, Linkerd got a diploma. They have graduated from the uh, sandbox to uh, the CNCF sandbox. That's pretty exciting. The Contributor Summit North America 2021 has planning has begun. If you have actually been there, definitely come check it out. If you haven't, this is what a great opportunity. I can't wait to see you there. It'll be really a lot of fun. So if you're curious about the event, here's the information for it. It'll be at the JW Marriott LA Live. Here's where you can register, the location and the schedule. All of that information is posted. I mean, as soon as it gets updated, I don't think the registration is there yet either, but yeah, no, uh, as soon as that registration link is available, you will be able to find it here. Oh, that's awesome. I've actually, uh, on a personal note, I've actually just recently decided to start exploring cubes because when I was a kid, I tried it and I was not very good at it. And uh, like the only way I could really solve these puzzle, these twisty, these twisty puzzles with a butter knife. And lately I've been totally obsessed with like solving all of the twisty puzzles. So now I have at my disposal like a two, a four, a couple of threes, a four, a seven, and this a 10. And it's, it's super fun. It gets your brain working in fun ways. So pretty cool. Hello, Russ. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> so another thing that I don't know if you've uh, if you've ever contributed to Kubernetes as, as a project, um, you've probably interacted with Phasabot, and Phasabot Fe Bot has been pretty amazing. And there, you know, it's got some pretty fun stories like this one, uh, where basically, basically somebody opened an issue to make sure that the Phasabot knew admit that it was a bot. Um, but what the, the bot does is basically uh, mark issues as stale if there's no activity on them after a time, and it will also take care of a lot of uh, a lot of other kind of maintenance and housekeeping stuff. Um, uh, but the awesome part is that it's being replaced with an official bot, so it's being retired. All of the automated comments formerly made by Phasabot are going to be made by the, K the Kubernetes triage bot as of this PR. The K Kubernetes triage bot account is fully under the project's own control, owned by SIG Contribx GitHub management subproject, which means basically that like it's another one of those pieces of infrastructure that is now actually managed by the community rather than by an individual, which is really pretty great. It's a pretty important bot and it handles things like lifecycle and a bunch of other stuff. So it is. It was pretty important that we that we get that pulled into the um, kind of under the auspices of the of the project itself. So you'll still see those same warnings and stuff. It'll just happen in a different way. There is a proposal. I don't know if you've looked into the sidecar stuff, but um, within Kubernetes, there's a proposal to support the idea of sidecars. Now, I know that this is kind of an overloaded term, in that when you think about a Kubernetes pod and you have uh, multiple pods inside of that pod or multiple containers running in the same pod. You think of all of them as sidecars of one another effectively, right? Um, what this proposal does is it describes a model around which we might be able to describe that individual, you know, that some of those containers might need to start before other containers. Right now, it's sort of just a list of containers, all of which will start somewhat um, uh, in, a, in, a, in an uncontrolled rate, right? And this is not taking into account init containers. That's not what I'm talking about. This is actually just within the construct of the, the containers list, um, or I guess it's an array really within the, um, within the pod itself, uh, giving some, giving some uh, capability there to kind of control it. Some of the problems that are trying to be solved there are like, if you had a log forwarder running as a, a second process within a pod, you clearly want that log forwarder to be kind of the last thing out, right? Because you would, want to make sure that it's able to forward all of the logs that it has access to before actually shutting that log forwarder down. So these, these are just some of the uh, relatively obvious use cases that people have. And if you're interested in this, they're looking for feedback. And so if this proposal makes sense to you, if you're happy with how this works, um, definitely uh, give a thumbs up. Otherwise, give some comments that uh, to uh, indicate like what you think might be an improvement.
if you're operating a Helm repository, uh, this is a kind of a surprise one. So if you're operating a Helm repository, repository credentials pass to alternate domain. So there's a, there's a hack that kind of lets people, <sighs> lets people kind of get a hold of the credentials when in an unexpected way. So while working on the Helm source, a Helm core, core maintainer discovered a situation where a username and password credentials associated with a Helm repository could be passed on to another domain inference referenced by that Helm repository. And the index YAML within the Helm chart repository contains a reference where the chart archive for each project is. So that means that if you were like, say you took the dependency for Nginx in your own chart, when you do in a Helm get or Helm fetch or Helm install or any of those things, um, of your own umbrella chart in your own private repository, then what could happen is that your username and password could be passed to whatever repository is holding the Helm chart, the Nginx chart as well. Um, and this is, you know, unexpected behavior. It's likely that they wouldn't do anything with it, but it's definitely an important one to understand. So that was a, a security problem and that has been addressed. Next on up, we have a pull request. This is a work in progress. Introduce documentation around managing a separate mount namespace. Now, this is a fascinating idea. And I had, I had not heard of it until uh, Joe had mentioned it in his, in his an announcement of this particular issue. So, um, and I think I could see how there would be challenges. But anyway, so the proposal here is that you have the ability to define a mount namespace in which uh, the ephemeral mounts that we create for pods would be associated, right? By default, right now, the mount namespace for all of the ephemeral stuff, like, you know, if you're going to do like a, a mount of type of, uh, if you're going to mount um, just a scratch space within a pod or what, or any of, or any of those sorts of things, like empty deer, then empty deer is mounted on the underlying host in the host's mount namespace and then passed as a volume into um, your running container as part of the instantiation of that container when you kick off a pod, or I should say when the cubic kicks off the pod. In this model, the idea is that anything that we would create ephemerally, we would actually associate with a different isolated mount namespace and maybe even share that mount namespace with like some other entity. And, or, and then that mount namespace is actually where we're gonna mount any volumes for your given pods in from which gives which is great because it improves the level of isolation between the pod and the underlying file system but i could see that it also might add a little bit of complexity so it's an interesting idea i haven't actually played with it myself um but if any of you out there play with it definitely i'm curious to get your opinion on it But definitely a cool read. Improves the security isolation boundaries, which I think is good. Kubernetes release cadence change. This is a blog as of July 20th. Um, so starting with the 122 release, a lightweight policy will drive the creation of each release schedule. The policy includes the first release and the last release of the calendar year. And the Kubernetes release cycle has, has a length of 15 weeks. So the week of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon is not considered a working week for the SIG release, mainly because like obviously everybody's at KubeCon or CloudNativeCon. Should be the weeks of actually, because there's a couple of them, right? There's EU and the US. So might be interesting to see if that was taken into account. As a rule, Kubernetes will, fo will follow a three releases per year cadence. Kubernetes 1.23 will, will be the final release of the 2021 calendar year, and the new policy results in a very predictable release schedule, allowing us to forecast upcoming release dates. Well, there you go, that's our new release cadence. This means that there will be fewer releases per year. Um, it doesn't really do anything with LCS or anything like that, but it does mean that there will be fewer releases. And it means perhaps it'll be a little bit easier to adopt and, and uh, pick up the latest releases for Kubernetes as things go. 
Yeah, it is a great question, Russ. I'm not sure what ha what happens with the uh, with the old with the old Fajabot as it goes out to pasture. That would be kind of a fun fun idea. The Sysbox Container Runtime. I was playing with this actually this week. So, uh, if you're unfamiliar with this idea, the idea is that you want to be able to run um, Docker containers that have System D or or, or uh, running inside of them. Make them look like they're actually a little closer to VMs. Now, like you know. I can definitely hear that on some level, this is a weird thing to want, right? Because you're you're operating a container. Why would you want it to look like a VM? Uh, you should be able to like, you know, keep with it. You should live with, you'd be able to live within your means within a container, not necessarily try to run like all of the Linux operating system stack inside of it. Well, one of the great use cases for this would be something like Kind, right? Wherein you could have, um, where you could run your Kubernetes nodes as containers inside of a inside of a cluster and so you're able to do a lot of testing um, in that scenario lightweight testing you're able to spin these things up and tear them down at effectively the same rate as containers themselves but not necessarily um, without the cost of virtualization so it also enables a lot more kind of like it's a great learning tool you know kubernetes and and docker are kind it gives you a, a great ability to kind of like play with all the different knobs and dials of kubeadm and that sort of stuff well, Sysbox is another one of these, and there are a few that I've been playing with lately. Footloose is another one of these. Sysbox is one. And and this tooling basically, Sysbox is actually, uh, Sysbox is pretty low level. It had it, happen, it has a, um, a run C driver for it, so you can actually plug it into your existing Docker. And I've done that. Play with it and see what it would look like. This is basically what you would add to provide another runtime for Docker. By default, Docker uses container D as the runtime. Um, but if you wanted to add another runtime, you could add one like this. And what this does is it gives you another command. So you could do Docker run, actually, history grep sysbox. So it gives you the ability to do something like this. Or you can run a specific container under that other runtime. In our case, I'm going to use the Docker runtime. I'm going to use the Sysbox Run C runtime. I'm going to remove it when it's done. I'm going to call it my container, and I'm going to pull from the image from the Nesty Box registry, and it's just the Ubuntu Bionic System D Docker. And we can see this thing kind of starts up like a container. It looks and feels very much like a container, not too dissimilar from the way that if you were to do this with um, a kind, it would work as well. Now, what's interesting is also the the, the mechanism, uh, this, this particular container image has pre-installed bits of Docker, right? So I can do Docker PS. Docker run. Didn't find the image locally. So now it's pulled it. Then I'm inside the container, uh, inside of another container. Kind of like Docker and Docker in some ways, right? So that's that is basically how it's working, and so this gives you kind of a more generic way of handling systemd um, pieces. Uh, one of the other pieces that Nest that uh, Sysbox does is it implements a user NS. So if you don't already have user NS, it won't work for you. Um, but there are some there were some interesting challenges there. Like I tried to run this on uh, an Archbox that had like the latest kernel, and it was not working for me at all. I had to drop back to more of an LTS release because apparently. This works really only really well in kind of like the older versions because of the shift to fest requirement. And so if you want to play with it, it's here. It's a fun one. It seems to work pretty well. And I've had I've had good luck with it. Um, one of the challenges I had previously was uh, I was trying to use Ansible to, I was, I was trying to use CubeSpray to install um, a Kubernetes cluster. And I wanted like Docker containers to do that because I didn't want to, um, 
go about managing all the things. Now, one thing I learned was that in Ansible's CubeSpray project, or in the CubeSpray project, if a host name isn't already set correctly, then a CubeSpray tries to set it. And the way that it does that is through this command. I'm as root right now. And if I do hostname kettle, help set hostname. Ooh. And that fails, and it gives me the output. Could not set property, failed to set static host name, device or resource busy. And that's wacky, because like even if, I, I would assume that that would be possible within the container, right? Because I can still do something like echo foo, host name. Then log in again, and boom, it's foo, right? So I can still change the host name that way. But something in the way that hostname kettle does it, like makes use of something that I don't understand yet and, and blocks it. So at some point, I might S trace that and see if I can figure it out, but kind of an interesting challenge. So this, in my, I guess all that to say, it didn't solve my problem, which was a very obscure problem to begin with, and that was the problem that I was running into. But it is neat, so definitely check it out if you're interested in VM-like containers. Argo vulnerability leads to crypto mining. If you're using Argo, definitely check out the vulnerability. The CNCF white paper, I haven't had a, take a, had a chance to look at this, but this is a, a new uh, tag for app delivery. And they're talking about um, the white paper, the, the final version here. So this is actually kind of, I think, a pretty solid write-up that was funded by the CNCF to talk about the operator pattern, how it works and all of that stuff. So if you've heard people talking about operators and you wanna know more about it, I think this is probably be a really good reference to begin with. Um, so definitely check that one out. I, I like that it's somewhat agnostic. It talks about the different frameworks that are, that are out there, QBuilder, COP, CNCF operator framework, the metadata controller. Um, talks about the lifecycle management and use cases for an operator. It talks about a bunch of different um, cool stuff and does it does a pretty good job. Yeah. So a great reference on operators. There's a new admission control micro framework, and then there's also the crustlet, which is a been it's been moving along pretty well, but it's Kubelet, Rust, and Wasm to give you the ability to run like WebAssembly as uh, containers instead of containers as containers. Pretty neat stuff. Nothing new in the CVE ground. And the next thing I wanted to start playing with was I wanted to uh, kind of explore that, uh, take us back to that blog post about API deprecation, just in case anybody had not already seen it. Here we are. So this article was written by Krishna Kalari and Tim Bannister, and it talks about the API removals in version 1.22. So when we get to version 1.22, which has already been cut, if you start migrating to it, one of the heads ups here is that you're going to start seeing um, things get taken away. Uh, you're gonna see the API not present for uh, particular groups. So let's talk through like which ones are going to be removed. And I, I, we covered a little bit of this in the last episode. If you want to check that out, it's on YouTube. But the thing that I wanted to point out here is like, you know, for example, validating webhook configuration, mutating webhook configuration originally was <coughs> V1 beta 1, and now it is just V1. So and, and the removal means that if you still have your object defined, that manifest uh, defined as API group admission admission registration .io slash v1 beta one then it's not it's going to fail and it's going to tell you there is no object at that uh, URL right and so that's going to be the experience that you have and you'll be surprised by it and there are a few other ones here custom resource definition that's a big one so if you haven't auto, if you have if you're not updating those custom resource definitions that you've created then you're going to get caught out by that.
There's a great example of custom resource definition in here somewhere in our docs. And it makes me wonder if ha, it is good. All right. So here's an example of a of a CRD that has been defined. Um, and I'm gonna actually go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and apply this. So I'm gonna go up here to raw. I'm gonna grab that URL and we're gonna go ahead and apply it and see what it looks like. So let's do find create cluster. And while we're doing that, oh, that's going to bring up 122. That's not what I want. Uh, do I have a 122? Let's go and take a look. Kindest node. It looks like to test this, we would have to build 122, unless I've already done that, which I might have done. But while we're waiting for that, let's go ahead and do this. Kind fleet cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and build Kubernetes real quick. I know that sounds kind of weird, but we're going to do it. So source Kubernetes. I'm gonna, and I've got it checked out locally. And the way that I check that out, uh, this is something I, re I learned or kind of relearned recently was that you have the um, go 111 module command. And if you set that to off, then you can do a go get k8s.io Kubernetes, and it will put it in go search k8s.io Kubernetes for you. If you have modules on, then it actually just checks out whatever the released version is and drops it into your modules so you can reference it. But for my case, I kind of wanted to have it just checked out locally so I could play with it, pull, make pull requests and that sort of stuff. So here we are, we're in go source k8s.io Kubernetes. I've done the checkout already and I'm gonna go ahead and change to a release branch. V1.22 We'll call it RC0. And we'll do get checkout dash b e rc. That's the first release candidate for it. And then I'm going to go ahead and do kind build node image name equals v1 kindest node to zero rc. Zero. I'll name it image. And because my local checkout in my go in my go environment is set to v one twenty two zero rc zero, that's where I that's what I've got checked out locally. Then kind will actually build that particular version and make it available to us. And we'll see if this works. I might have to actually grab the the, um, the, the the current release or the top of tree release for kind to make it work. But let's see what let's see what happens if we bundle it up this way first. And maybe we won't have to do too much more. But this will give us the ability to um, go ahead and test out those expiring APIs and see what that looks like. So while that's happening, let's go back over here. So these are the things that are being affected. So any automation that you have that um, does a token review, you might want to check a look at anything with subject access review or local subject access review, self subject access review, anything you're doing that's actually checking the credentials or any uh, testing that you do for any of those things, any of those objects have to be defined in that way. The beta certificate signing requests is now no longer beta and it's not going to be available. The lease API, if you use it, uh, and the ingress object, right? Ingress extensions v1 beta 1 and networking k8s.io v1 beta 1. This one has been around for quite a long time and it will be removed from serving. It means it will not be available. And if you were to try and create an object with that old version, 
it will not be available. Now there's a couple a couple things that I covered last time, but I'll just re I'll reiterate here real quick. And that is if you ever ever wondering what version is the right version, right? You can do kubectl explain for that particular object. So let's take an ingress for example. I have a cluster up. So kind create cluster name equals one dot. kubectl explain ingress and kubectl explain gives you lots of great information including right up here at the top what the target version should be and what the kind should be right and if you wanted to know more about the spec if you wanted to kind of explore that spec somewhat dynamically the entire spec is defined here right and so you can do things like kubectl explain ingress recursive and it will give you all of the fields that you could possibly define within that object and if you wanted to know what status load balancer ingress was going to be right you could do kubectl ingress spec status. And here are the fields that are viable for that particular object, right? And so you can dig into a particular object lower and lower. You can look at the spec. And at any point you can do recursive and see like the entire uh, construct of the spec all right there, very easy to kind of navigate and troubleshoot and see what's happening here. So this is one way of understanding, like if I wanted to do like a cube kettle, explain, self subject access review right so it is under authorization case iov1 that is the correct version and the kind would be self subject access review and again here's all the information for the object that's one way of determining the group another great way to look at it is this right cube kettle api resources So, actually, let me just grab ingress. So, in this particular output, uh, and this is a tricky one because this will actually show all of the API uh, resources that are, are being served currently, like what things you can define. And in this case, you can see that you could define uh, ingress under networking case.io slash v1, or you could also in define an ingress under extensions v1 beta 1. And that's because we're running version 1.21. If we're running 1.22, we would not be able to do that. Looks like we're almost through our build here. Lots of good CPU time. Oh, look. Well, it's slowing down a little bit. Hope y'all can hear me OK. Shouldn't be too long. So. That that's another one. And then the last one, which is also useful, is kubectl API versions. So we can tell that, like, you know, for particular groups, what versions are available. So networking.k.io has networking v1 and networking k.io 
slash v1 beta 1. Let's just build for a second and then jump back into our docs. So, but one of the things I really want to make sure that we highlight is that like removal means removal. It means it will no longer be served. It means that if you try to create that object, it will no longer be there, right? Um, and we're going to play with that just in a minute. When I get 122 up, we're going to start up a 122 cluster and like deploy some stuff that is that, that don't work anymore. So for ingress, migrate to use the newer API. This is going to be true of pretty much everything. Um, the related API ingress class is designed to complement the ingress concept, allowing you to configure multiple kinds of ingress within one cluster. If you're currently using the deprecated ingress.class annotation, plan to switch to ingress class name field instead. And I believe that was actually handling being handled kind of somewhat automatically when migration would happen. So there's great information here for each of the different kinds of things that are being torn down. There is a plugin to kubectl that provides the kubectl convert subcommand. It's an official plugin that you can download as part of Kubernetes. So you download Kubernetes for details. I was not aware of this plugin. This used to be a, fee a function that um, uh, it's kind of a bad link. I want to know more about convert. So this used to be a functionality of kubectl. But I'm really curious about the plugin. So let's let's actually go looking for that. I mean, crew might have it. Oh, maybe it's already there. Am I missing something super obvious? So they reference crew update. Interesting. So they reference it, but it doesn't look like it's there. I don't have it. So in theory, I should be able to grab it from here if it exists. So let's do that. Let's let's try that out. Kubectl 
conversion. I'm currently running 121.3. It would be held in some place different than this, I don't think. Actually, this new file. I'll be damned. All right. That's cool. So they basically moved the functionality of convert into a plugin and they made the plugin available, but they didn't necessarily, it doesn't look like it's packaged, packaged together yet. Nor have they registered that with crew. That's really cool. I mean, it's cool that it exists. The packaging could use a little work. Probably should update this to uh, include the kubectl convert piece. But the way plugins work, um, the way plugins work is anything that has the word kubectl and then a dash and then something after it, that's actually how the plugin uh, trick will work, right? So kubectl will discover that and make those plugins available to you. So that's pretty neat. Let's take a look at our build here. Okay, that's done. So I'm going to do kind create cluster config, actually image equals v one zero. What did I call it? Oh, this may or may not work. Let's see if it works. It might work. It'd be awesome if it did. Hey! Kubectl version. 122RC0. Woohoo! All right. So now, if I go back over here... And I do kubectl create ingress tests. Well, thanks. Uh, kubectl create. Oh, you know what? I'm on the wrong one, so I have to um, create deployment test, which equals nginx, replicas equals one, expose, actually, port equals 80, context, Twenty one. I'll then do expose deployment dash test 
x equals kind of one dot twenty one. I'm going to create a service of type cluster IP for that guy. And then I'm going to do kubectl takes ingress backend equals default test context equals 21. Now here's the fun part. You can actually do, uh, this is what I wanted to show you. You can actually pull the previous version of an object. So if I do kubectl get ingress test context equals kind of 1.21 dash over YAML. So there is the, um, the current a valid object. And I can actually create this same object, but it's by copying it to our new context. But I'm not going to do that right away. Instead, what I want to do is I want to pull an older version of it. I think I can still do here. Ingress. This is kind of wild, but check it out. So this time, I'm actually going to use the old extensions, the one that's actually being removed from the cluster. So if I do that, I can see that um, I'm doing kubectl get ingresses extensions. So I'm telling it that I want it to convert whatever object it has in etcd into this particular version of object, so that I can see the results of that object, right? And it's going ahead and it's gone ahead and done that. It's created extensions v1 beta one. It's a type ingress and here's the content that i had uh back end was service name test and the service port was 80. and if i get if i just go back to just uh get ingress you can see the difference here right so create timestamp is the same generation is the same name is the same uh, resource version is the same the configuration looks a little bit different uh, before it was back end service name service port now it's default back end service name service port OK, so let's grab that old one. And then we're going to just pipe that to our 122 cluster and see what uh, how, what happens here. So <clears throat> we had two really interesting outcomes. <laughs> the first really interesting outcome is that kubectl itself on evaluating the object that I was getting ready to present to our 1.22 cluster told me, hey, warning, this is deprecated. You probably want to move to networking k8.io slash v1. That is awesome. The second one, and more interesting and more relevant to this particular testing, is that when I applied this object to the 1.22 cluster, I saw this error come back. Unable to recognize no matches for kind ingress in version extensions v1 beta 1. So this is the area you're, you're going to want to watch for. Yeah, the thing doing the conversion is the API server, correct? Yep. Um, but this is the error that you're going to kind of want to watch for. Uh, if you, if you're, you'll know that you're hitting this problem when you see this error. No matches for kind. Is the key is the thing, right? That's actually where you're gonna where it's gonna catch you out.
The next thing I wanted to show you, I wanted to do was just grab another example. Um, so hold on one second here. So response body. Oh, that's everything. All right, so now I'm gonna dig into the, the bones here a little bit and show you some other interesting stuff that is happening behind the covers. And this is like probably the easiest way I can think of to do a test on like self-subject access review. So first understanding what self-subject access review is. Uh, one way to conceptualize this is to, is, to ask, is to basically, it's the idea that you can query the API server uh, with specific questions to determine what access you have, right? So if I were to do kubectl auth, can I, one of my favorite commands actually, uh, and then I do list, for example, and it will show me all of the permissions that I have with my current credential against the API server according to the API server itself. And the way that it does this is through this self-subject access review. And actually in this particular case, it has to do with a self-subject access the self-subject rules review because I'm having it list all of my permissions for this given namespace uh, as an authenticated user. Now let's say I create a new uh, a new user, right? So let's do kubectl. Actually, let's do this. Let's do kubectl auth can I list, and we'll just use the default service account in the default namespace and take a look at that one, right? As I'm going to impersonate. System service account default. Okay. And that's the default service account in the default namespace. And we've identified it as a system service account. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to run this command, this self subject access review, but it's going to impersonate this particular service account and get the result back. So, my question was what permissions do, does the default service account have? We can see that they're very different than the permissions that we have as an admin, right? So like, like I basically have like cluster admin role right now. So I have all of the permissions for all of the things, but the default service account does not. It can do a create of self-subject access reviews. It can do a create of self-subject rules review. And then it has the ability to understand a little bit about the configuration of the cluster. So it can basically walk the API and see what resources are there, but that's about it, right? Interesting stuff. Now, what I was showing you before was if I wanted to see, for example, what the API call was that made this API, that, that made this request, I can actually pull that open and take a look, right? And so here is the request body. And you'll notice that it looks a lot like the JSON stuff or the, or the YAML stuff that we normally see. So it's a self-subject access review, API version, authorization k8.io slash v1. And then there's no, the, the metadata is effectively empty. The spec is defining the namespace in which I want to, spe to see. And, and then the status object ex exists, but doesn't matter. And so here is the curl request. If I were going to use curl to do this, and we can see now that one of the biggest takeaways of this particular piece of it is that you can see kind of how the API removal will affect you, right? If we are looking at the API object, the group is defined right after, the group and the version are defined right after this well-known path slash APIs. So inside of my YAML document, right? Let's, let's actually, let's take a look at that ingress again that we were looking at before. Inside of here, I'm saying API version networking k8.io slash v1. And I'm saying kind ingress, right? 
And if I just apply that, kubectl apply, dry run. Woo, all right. Oh, bunch of data, but actually, you know what? It would be easier. Girl. There we go. So here's the curl making the call, and it's saying it's going to put that according to the doc. The kubectl has converted that based on the YAML that I have provided. It has picked up the group and it has applied it in that URI. So it's going to send it to my API server on slash APIs inside of the networking.ks.io on version v1. It's a namespaced object. So it determines what namespace I've targeted, the default namespace by default. And then the ingress create the ingress object I've created is called test. Right? So that is effectively how that conversion happens. And if that API gets removed, you won't be able to see it. If you send the 121 version of the output of the ingress to the kubectl convert plugin, it will convert it to 122. And it should deploy correctly in the 120. Yeah, that's right. Let's try that. It's a great example. So the question is, if you send the 121 version of the object to kubectl convert, will it convert it? So it is interesting. I expected that to go a different way. Honestly, I did. Because what's fascinating about that is that it, it came out as incorrect as it went in, which is really neat. I know that you can pass versions. And so I wonder if I have to be explicit about the version or maybe, actually, what if I do output version? Nah, I shouldn't have to do that. You know what will do the conversion? This is kind of an interesting one. So before we get into it here, let's do kubectl apply dash f dash. If I apply it, if I apply it to a cluster that has both versions, then the output will be converted. I know. Kind B. Ah, it still took it. So what I want to see. Look at this one more time. There might be a way to get it to. That's neat. I mean, oh, I see. I see. 
I got it now. Hold on. If I pull the plug in, that's cool. Okay, hold on. Let's see, um, uh, history grip convert. Yeah. Although that's still pretty busted. But let's grab the 122 version of this. And try it that way. Oh, still fails. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I could do the output version thing, but the problem is that you would have to know what the output version was, right? And the idea is that this would actually automatically convert this for you. Uh, Networking.kxio slash B1. Out of curiosity. Okay. If you know it, it will actually convert it for you correctly. But if you don't know it, then it'll work for you. That one still works. Yeah, that's kind of a trip. That's a very good point. Because otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't really know. Yeah. Anyway, that's fascinating. So thank you for pointing that out. That was a great question. I do think that it would be good. I wonder if there's like some other piece of kubectl convert that I'm missing. If valid use schema to validate. Not what I'm looking for. Output version basically should be like a kind of a latest or something. Does not appear to be. I think the old kubectl convert did do that. The old kubectl convert did actually expect uh, and it basically comes down to discovering what the preferred version is and then using that preferred version. So I wonder if they've wired it up to a new API that doesn't exist yet because there is now there will soon be a uh, an API that describes the the oh actually in my kubectl yeah, API resources No, it doesn't have it yet. But there is a new API behind like a beta piece that I read about last week um, that gives you the ability to kind of define the preferred version in an API. And so I wonder if if that existed, whether kubectl convert would be able to consume it and make the right decision. But it used to be that kubectl convert would determine what the preferred version was, and then it would pick that. Uh, and that's not what's happening here. Instead, what it's doing is just 
I don't get what the convert part is. It's actually just taking the object and dropping it in the same way that it, it went in, it dropping it out the same way it went in. So it seems like a bug on the on the plugin part. Anyway, so the last few things I wanted to cover before I bounce out of here are there are a few other things that are worth calling out. Um, and these are different projects that I found um, that give you the ability to understand whether things are deprecated or falling out of uh, or, or have expired. Uh, thank you. So Cube No Trouble is a great example of this. It basically looks for um, objects that have been created and then uh, uh, the, on a deprecated version and warns you about them. Now, uh, this is a neat one because it actually looks at the thing. It looks like Helm charts. It looks at things, uh, metadata that's been left behind, right? So, like, if you, for example, were to do kubectl get ingress tests, Uh, it didn't work here, but um, sometimes it'll actually leave behind a metadata for um, actually, let's see, what if I just do get deployment? Nope. But from time to time, when you're deploying things, it will actually keep a meta. It'll keep a metadata record for what was what was the deployed configuration, and things like Cubend can actually look at that uh, metadata and determine that uh, when the object was applied to the cluster, it was uh, stored in an old version. Some of the other tools out there are Pluto by the wonderful folks at Fairwind Ops. Does a very similar thing. You can apply it. You can actually point this at your cluster, or you can point it at your source code, and it will try to evaluate whether those things are expired or not. Cube Pug, the third one, written by Ricardo Katz, community member, might even be on the call today. Gives another way of actually just exploring this as a crew plugin. And then the last one is deprecation written by a good friend, uh, Steve Wade. Um, and he is doing the, exactly the same thing, just like evaluating those manifests that you provided and trying to determine whether those manifests are using expired APIs. And that is our session for today. I wanted to say thank you very, very much for joining me. It really means a lot. Um, I hope these sessions are useful and I look forward to the next one in two weeks. And uh, Come right back here, and I'll, I'll meet you again in two weeks, and we'll cover some other interesting, fascinating part of all of this. So hope you all have a great week, and I'll see you soon. If you liked what you see, shout out on Twitter. Follow me on Maui, follow, follow me at Maui Lion anywhere, and also subscribe to the channel. Talk to you all later. All righty.